Welcome Wastelanders to this Fallout Wasteland Warfare tutorial game. In this playlist, we've talked about a lot of things, gone over like why you should be interested in the game, some kind of dipping your toe into the lore, as well as uh, learning like how to get started in collecting stuff. But now I want to try to pivot and go into more gameplay. How do we bring this to life on the tabletop? And so we're going to begin that with sort of how I want to do content in the future. You see, there's going to be this video where we talk about the actual mechanics of the game, but then I'm going to release a battle report that kind of skips on the mechanics and talks about flavor. This is how you play the game, and then the other video will be how you turn that game into a story. So let's learn how to play Fallout Wasteland Warfare. So the way that I'm going to do this is I picked my favorite mission from the 2024 Adepticon uh, Wasteland Warfare event pack, uh, which is fan made and it's a wonderful thing. It only plays on a two by two, so it's very small, very tight and short games. Uh, and I'm gonna pick a mission from there and we're gonna go through all of the very basic actions that you take and learning how to do those because you can sum up the entirety of this game uh, by move, charge, uh, the skill test, and then attacking, right? How damage is resolved or whatever. So four to five things really at its core and we're gonna learn how to do those very quickly. In the battle report then, I'll just play the mission out and you'll understand all those things that are going on in the background. So let's get you started in playing. Before we jump into that though, I will say, if you're already gonna be looking for Modifius products and maybe your local store doesn't have them, please consider using the affiliate link in my link tree down below. Modifius is exceptionally generous to the content creators who send people their way with an affiliate program that supports me. And every time you use that link, big or small, it throws a tip in my tip jar and goes directly to supporting me, my wife, our cats, the whole thing could not be more grateful. Also, it keeps things ad free, which is a blessing for everybody because YouTube got a little crazy. So to get us everything we need to get started, my kind of like suggested path for getting into the game is you have your core set of models, preferably the two player starter set because I guess everything you need, uh, but you have your models you're gonna use. You have probably the list builder app because it makes things simple and a 500 cap list. This is really all that's required to play Fallout Wasteland Warfare at its most base and semi balanced level. The mission pack as I suggested is from the 2024 um, Adepticon event called the Dirt Haven Dust Up. And I have that linked down below so you can start seeing how it's written out, but it's very plain English and very simple. In my later battle report, I'm going to have uh, super mutants attacking a gang of raiders. And so I'm gonna be using those models uh, for you know, directions and that kind of stuff in this tutorial. Now, one thing you're gonna see if you are following along with the Dirt Haven Dust Up pack is that uh, the way that they handle secondaries is very interesting. Each player gets three objectives, marked one through three or four through six, and you assign what each of these uh, objectives are going to be before the game. Essentially, when a player approaches these things, what skills do they have to test to claim this objective? That's what you're deciding. So you wanna lean into things that are advantageous for your warband, maybe your opponent doesn't do so well. So for example, at Adepticon, I played against a Brotherhood of Steel player who had two out of the three of his objectives be intelligence based. So you have to do intelligence checks. And my raiders don't have two brain cells to rub together, so they were quite helpless to take his objective. Uh, I got, I lucked out on one of them, but it was dicey. When you succeed, you get a victory point and that token disappears. I can explain how all of this stuff works in a dedicated video about the tournament pack later. I just wanted to fill you in because that's gonna be in the battle report, so I wanted to give you some context. So coming back to setup, you get your two by two board. You're gonna lay out the objectives of the mission as it dictates that diagonal three across the center. And then you and your opponent are gonna alternate in putting objectives on the board. And essentially the way it works out measurement wise is you have, you divide the board into thirds. There's just one that's kind of on your side, one towards the middle and one towards your opponent's side. You both do that, which means every third of the table, there's two objectives. The way scoring works in this particular mission is very simple. You walk up to a objective token that you or your opponent placed, do whatever test is being told you should do, and then you get it, you know, get one VP that turn and the token disappears. As far as the three in the center though, that diagonal line from the core mission, those don't go away. They stay there every turn. And if you are controlling it and your opponent is not, or there's no opponents, you know, immediately in base-to-base -base contact with it, uh, you get one victory point for controlling the one in the center, and you get two victory points for controlling the one that's opponent's deployment edge. 
Holding your own gives you nothing. So this is a mission that incentivizes you to spread out to claim those initial um, you know, tokens that you and your opponent put out, the secondaries, but also then push really hard to get into your opponent's home field, basically, uh, to claim their objective. And with that, round one can begin. And I like this mission pack because it really is that simple. You pick the mission, lay the tokens out as it was, you and your opponent can already have decided what, you know, the little tests you want your secondary tokens to be, and you just throw those on the board, boom, you're in it. Now, personally, I find setting up the board and getting all that initial kind of stuff prepared to be the most burdensome part of a game. So we're already past that. So I have three kind of grand topics for us to chat about that are gonna sum up the entirety of Fallout for your general experience, okay? It really is this simple. I know it's intimidating, but it all comes down to movement, a sub par of which, you know, an asterisk is charging, but it's all movement. We need to talk about skill tests, how you achieve things or just know what your skills are good at or bad at. And lastly, how combat works. With this, you're gonna move across the board, achieve your objectives, and hopefully unleash hell upon your enemies. So let's kick it off with movement and charging. This is really, really simple. You're gonna look at the color here on the unit card. There are instructions for how to read this if you are colorblind, so just know that's in the core rules as well. And you're gonna grab the appropriate measuring stick. Models in this game move front to back on that. This does make it a bit different from other miniature games where typically you move in like front to front and that number of inches. Nope, this one you throw the template down and then move the model to the opposite end of the template. That's all there is for movement. You can choose to move multiple times in the game. And each time you just put the template in front of the model, action you want ahead and go that way. Now let's talk about charging. It's just a special kind of movement. Charging works the exact same as other movements, but you use the second color indicated on the, the unit's card instead of the first. Typically, this gives you a little bit more distance to simulate like the person really moving with momentum into combat. The caveat is when this movement ends and you can end at any point along that distance, it has to end base to base with an enemy. Meaning you can't just charge off in the middle of nowhere and get extra distance. It has to be used to get into combat. And you get a little bonus. After you finish this charge, you get to either choose a damage or accuracy die. And you put a little token there to remind you of it next time. And the idea is the next time your character attacks, you can spend that token, get the extra die added to your attack pool. Unlike other games, it does not give you a free attack. And so let's say, for example, if you have two actions, you could move, move, or you could move, charge, which means you end in combat, but you have no actions left to fight with, but you get to keep that bonus token. So whenever you fight next, you still get to do better at it. Or ideally, you charge and attack. You get the little extra movement and you get to immediately use that bonus. All in all, it's very simple. Choose the correct measuring stick based on what you want to do and move the model across it. Now, the next topic to bring into this discussion is skill checks. And skill checks truly are the easiest thing in the world. Determine what you need to check, meaning if it's an intelligence check, it's going to be your intelligence stat. What are you checking? And then you roll the skill die, which is the white one with all the different sides. If the number is equal to or below your stat number or whatever you're testing for, you succeed. There's a critical success and a critical fail on the die, so just know that those exist. And some special abilities may modify the results here, but that's really it. So I have this raider here, and I call her Boom Boom, and she wants to make a test to open this stash box. Let's say, for example, that this test calls for a melee attack test. I'm gonna look at her card and I see that that is next to her agility stat, so I'll be rolling that, it's my target number. I roll the die, rolling below it, and boom, much success. With all that, we're ready to talk about fighting. We bought charges, how you get into combat, and skill tests, but fighting is a kind of skill test, but it's a little bit different. And I'm gonna break this discussion down into two parts, dealing damage and taking damage. Both of them happen in combat, generally speaking. So we have a raider here that wants to shoot a super mutant. They declare the attack, choose which weapon they're gonna use, and measure the range. You're gonna roll the skill die, and again, just like we did with the skill test before, if you roll equal to or lower than the relevant skill, whatever the weapon is testing, the attack succeeds. But there are a lot of ways when it comes to weapons to make things more or less successful. Here's an example. This character, Skag as I call him, 
has an assault rifle. Now on his unit card, it says that he tests rifles on his agility score of seven, which is a great shot. Our next step is to determine the range of the attack. So we look at the assault rifle thing. And what you want to remember is that these ranges stack. So everything, every one that he can shoot within that first band will get dice bonuses below that. And if anything is beyond the range of that first one, then you'll use that second template. So his maximum threat range, my point being, is those two templates combined. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, as I said, below each range band, uh, you'll see for any additional dice to be rolled in skill check. So for this example, we're going to roll our skill die a black and green dice. Green dice generally help with accuracy, and then all the other dice have special effects or other things that they list off, but we're gonna keep it simple with this. Now looking at our example here, our attack will hit because the final score rolled is less than the target number of his agility, which is seven. Negative modifiers on those additional dice that you roll lower the die that you rolled. So all that means is our attack hit, but how much damage did we actually do? Well, for that, we look at what we just rolled, and we can see the little symbol there. That's a damage symbol. We add that many damage to the base weapon stat. In this case, it's damage two. And we know that our raider hit, and it caused a total of three physical damage because of that little shield, it means there's different damage types. Don't worry about it too much. Most of the weapons are physical until you get into some of the weirder weapons. But just for the most part, if you stick with rifles and pistols for learning the game, it's just physical. So that's how doing damage works. You're just doing two things. Did you hit them? Yes or no. You're looking at the core number you rolled along with any modifiers. How much damage did you do? That's the base weapon plus any of the little star damage things uh, that you rolled along the way. But let's talk about taking damage. We're gonna switch now to the perspective of our super mutant in taking damage to a model. So how does armor work in the post-apocalypse? I find this is the place where most folks seem to struggle. And I think honestly it's because it's written very strangely in the core rules, but I think when you see it, it'll click for you. We know how much damage Skag just dropped on our super mutant friend here, right? Three physical damage. The aviator has a physical defense stat of two once his war gear is factored in. And we're gonna take this red damage dice and we're gonna roll it. The aviator, just like the attacker, wants to roll the target number or lower and reduces incoming damage by that amount. So if our boy here rolls a two, well, his armor value is two, that's dead on. So he will deflect two out of the three damage coming his way and suffer one wound. If instead he were to say roll a one, well, he still succeeds in blocking some damage because it's below his target number of two, his armor stat, so he'll block one damage and take two of the three coming at him. If you roll over your target number, so if you rolled a three or four, he takes all the damage because he's failed the test. At its core, that's all there is to it. There are two other little things I want to throw on here as far as notes go. One of them is that some types of armor, you'll see like a plus one next to this number. That just means you're going to do the test the exact same way the super mutant did, but no matter what, you're at least going to reduce one. So if our super mutant had that same armor stat two, but had a plus one next to it, he would immediately be taking one less damage from the attack. So now he's just trying to save two damage. The other thing you'll see is these little tokens that are sometimes on the board. Uh, these are derived from certain effects or armor or something like that. Essentially, they are one use of those plus ones. So it'll absorb one wound, but then it'll disappear. Certain abilities, drugs, uh, food, that kind of stuff will give you these. But in most of my games, unless you're rocking power armor, most of them are just a flat stat based on what kind of equipment the individual character has. And that, friends, honestly, is all there is to it. And I'm going to do an entire battle report. You can see a full game that would have been played at Adepticon using only really these skills. You have to be able to move, charge, do a test to get victory points and unlock objectives and that kind of stuff, and then just do basic combat. All other rules that you read in this game are built upon those fundamental things. I hope you found this video helpful. Like I said, there's going to be another one going in tandem with this. I hope that you'll check out that so you can see what these mechanics look like when they're trying to tell us. We're going to have, uh, what, mutant radioactive orcs versus dirt people in <laughs> my favorite battle report uh, I'm trying to put together anyway. I think that you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and spending some time learning about a game that I love. I hope to see you in my next video. Happy Wargaming.